Hi everyone, Sneemaster here. CIG is really vague on the in-game technologies that are used by the various factions, but one of their most important technologies has been shields used to protect ships and vehicles. I wanted to cover the gameplay on shields and the potential in-game science behind them. Unfortunately, there has been almost no description on how they work scientifically, so I figured I would analyze a few possibilities while I do that. Just a note of warning, I'm no physicist, so I could get some of the science wrong feel free to correct me at any time. To start with, CIG lists on their site that shields are an energy field that protects the ship from debris and weapon fire. They range from size 0, used by ground vehicles, to size 4 for capital ships. Energy weapons are absorbed completely by the shield, while ballistic weapons are only slowed down. Missile explosions are like ballistic attacks over a wider area. Energy and ballistic weapons do decrease the shield's power by the amount of energy the shield absorbed with energy weapons dropping shields faster and more powerful shots decreasing the remaining shield power by a larger amount than smaller shots. If you want to drop a ship's shield quickly, then energy weapons are the way to go. Shields are generated by shield emitters placed around the ships or vehicles, although you can barely see them on small ships. In the future, damaging a shield emitter will affect the shields supported by that emitter. The larger the shield a ship has, the more sections they have, which allows the ship to remain protected in other sections that were not hit. Small shields are only just one single bubble. If you drop the shield in any spot, the whole shield drops. Medium shields have two faces, one in front and one in back, with a half shell each, so dropping the front shield won't affect the rear shield. Large and capital shields have four or more sections to them, so only those individual sections fall if a shield face is dropped. Ships can also have more than one shield, which are placed on top of each other like an onion. Dropping one shield and the shield below it may still function, just at a weaker strength. You have to overwhelm all the shields in that section to fully damage a ship in that area. Shields that are hit require time to recharge and cannot recharge when they are under fire, so it's important to protect the shield being hit until it has time to recharge. For example, by turning the ship away so that the shield is away from the attack. Attackers with high fire rate weapons can keep a target ship's shields from regenerating so that other weapons can be used to damage the ship directly. It's often good to have a mix of repeaters and cannons for this situation. To damage a ship in a particular location with laser weapons, you need to drop the shields completely in that section, otherwise the energy weapons will be blocked. With ballistic weapons, you can still damage a target even if it has shields, although recently CIG has implemented a feature where a fully charged shield can nearly completely reduce ballistic damage, up to the shield's power level. Larger ballistics can still overwhelm the shield, of course. Keep in mind that ballistic weapons will in the future be able to theoretically hit the shield emitter on a ship directly under a shield with good aiming, even if the shield is up, although at reduced damage, and doing so can reduce the functionality of that shield from that emitter until the emitter is finally destroyed. The new component targeting and precision weapon aiming system is designed to help with all that, so in a future patch you'll be able to target and damage shield emitters on a ship directly. The future armor system will be used to block or reduce ballistic damage to components, especially shield emitters, for those situations, so armor ships will have an advantage over unarmored ones against ballistic and missile attacks. There are also different types of shields. You have shields based on categories such as military shields, which are highly resistant to damage and have a high recharge speed at the cost of higher power usage and more emissions. Stealth shields give off a weaker emission, so they are harder to detect and they use less power at the cost of weaker shield strength. Competition shields have less strength but the highest recharge rate, so they are good against multiple weaker attacks like repeater weapons. Industrial shields have the most resistance and use less power, but they recharge slowly and give off a lot of emissions. Then there are some alien and outlaw shields that have weird one-off effects. Tavaran shields are more resistant to ballistics. Within these categories, you also have variants based on shield quality. Shields go from D quality at the worst up to A quality at the best. The quality mostly affects the shield's strength or power usage, but also the price. Higher quality shields cost more, but have better features. Right now though, in the current 3.23.1 patch, all the shields function about the same in quality, but that hopefully will change in a future patch, maybe 4.0 or later. On top of these variations, there are more variations by company, even within the same category and quality. Some companies make more durable shield emitter components that are more resistant to physical attacks, but of weaker shield strength. Some are better against splash damage and missile attacks, but worse against direct damage. Some can absorb damage better, but use more power or make more heat. Again, in the current patch, the shields don't really vary, but they will differentiate in the future. Now for the shield technology itself. 
We have a few possibilities based on the properties we can observe. We know that the shields are invisible until they are hit by something, and that they function both in atmosphere and in space. We know that energy weapons are blocked and ballistics are only slowed or reduced. One thing we don't know is exactly how energy weapons work. Are they actually laser shots using a pure laser, or maybe plasma bolts where a gas is heated up and accelerated? That could help determine the shield technology, but we'll see what we can figure out. The most basic shield technology would be a magnetic or electric field around the ship. This type of shield would be invisible and possibly work against metallic ammunition and ionized or plasma weapons, even in atmosphere, but would not work well against actual laser weapons or particles that are not magnetic. It would also have to have a very powerful magnet for it to work. That sort of field would destroy even people getting near it as well as electronics. This type of shield would not get reduced strength when hit by weapons though, and a lack of resistance against energy or neutral particle attacks means it doesn't seem to fit the Star Citizen shields. Next, you could have a shield that uses a magnetic field to hold physical particles in place around the ship. These could be magnetic filings or magnetic dust in a thick shield. The shield could possibly work against lasers and physical attacks, but would not work in atmosphere as the air would be very resistant against the particles and melt the particles. Plus, it would light up brightly when moving quickly in air. To make the shield useful in combat, it would have to be very thick, so it would look like a dark cloud around the ship, which is not what we see in-game, so it's probably not that. You could have a magnetic field around the ship that contains a plasma made up of energized or heated gas, but it would light up very brightly at all times around the ship. You wouldn't even be able to see outside the cockpit from the constant brightness, and you would show up brightly to all the ships even at a far distance. Since the particles are already very energized, they may not be able to absorb damage from laser or energy weapons very well. They would probably also get swept away or de-energized when flying in an atmosphere, so it's probably not this either. The last option is that the UEE uses their gravitational technology similar to their quantum drive and artificial gravity. In this case, space itself is bent around the ship, either in an outward shape or in a spinning sphere around the ship. If space itself is bent, then both energy and ballistic weapons would be affected. Ballistics would have more of their own mass, so they could get through a shield like that, but with less energy. In our current physics, we know that mass affects space-time, and a moving mass can move space around it, which can move any objects in that space. This is called frame-dragging or gravitomagnetism. If we can get a gravitational field in space to move space around the ship, then that could block incoming weapons fire and be invisible unless weapons are impacting the shield. One problem is that light would be curved around the ship, so the ship would look all distorted when the shield is on. Maybe light itself is too fast for the space-time curve, but plasma and ballistics are not. Who knows? That would mean the energy weapons in-game are not pure lasers, but are just plasma bolts or plasma beams instead. The main problem with this system is even a huge mass like the Earth only causes a very faint frame-dragging effect. We would have to have a very dense artificial mass in a very small area of space to have a shielding effect, but we can't be lugging a planet with us in our spaceships. Mass and energy are equivalent though, so maybe if we can get enough energy in a small amount of space, then the energy would be dense enough to create gravitational fields. Maybe high power, high energy gamma rays in the Terra electron volt energy level or higher could do the trick. Why gamma rays? Let me explain how they work first. Gamma rays are electromagnetic radiation on the highest energy side of the spectrum. The spectrum is divided by wavelengths. Longer wavelengths have less energy, such as radio waves. Then you get shorter microwaves, then infrared, then visible light, UV, X-rays, and finally gamma rays. Gamma rays have the shortest wavelengths, but the most energy. You want the smallest wavelengths to be able to fit in the smallest amount of space, so you have the dense enough energy. We want to get nearly as small as the Planck length, which is the smallest size you can have in the universe. Similar to a black hole, the more energy or mass in a smaller space, the more gravitational effect is created. So gamma rays would be perfect for this, but it also requires the most energy. Not only that, but making gamma rays is very hard. Electromagnetic waves are created when a charged particle is moved back and forth. For example, the electrons moving back and forth in antenna on an old TV. The faster you move the particles back and forth, the shorter the wavelength. For example, in an antenna, the electrons are already moving very fast, near the speed of light, and the length of the antenna determines how long it takes the electrons to move back and forth, thereby setting the frequency. Shorter antennas have shorter wavelengths and more frequency. Electromagnetic frequency is measured in hertz, or how many times a wave cycles per second. Radio waves can be between 1 kHz to 3000 GHz, the visible light frequency is 400 to 750 trillion Hz, and gamma rays are over 30 exahertz, or 3 times 10 to the 19th waveforms per second. That is very fast. 
For example, with light, we can just excite the atoms in a gas with energy such as an electric charge. This will jiggle the electrons in those atoms, and for them to cool down, they emit photons in a specific frequency. Gamma rays require much smaller jiggling, though, so small that it is only the distance of a proton vibrating inside an atom or smaller. So we can't just pump energy into a gas or a crystal laser, since even the typical electron jiggle would be too large. We have to wiggle charged particles even smaller and faster than that to make our gamma rays. Typical gamma rays are created in a few ways. For example, when an atom's nucleus is excited by nuclear decay after a fission or fusion reaction, then it can emit a gamma ray. Nuclear bombs and nuclear waste are well known for that, but the gamma rays released are not strong enough. You can get an energy level of 5 mega electron volts to tens of mega electron volts in atomic bombs, but unfortunately to affect spacetime we'd need the energy to be much, much higher, closer to 10 to the 19th giga electron volts for the wavelength to be small enough. Another option is colliding electrons with its antimatter form of anti-electrons, also known as positrons, to create gamma rays. On collision, the two particles release their mass as energy in the form of gamma rays. The combined particles have a base energy of 0.511 mega electron volts, which is decent, but you can increase that energy by accelerating the electrons and positrons very fast before they hit. We still need the energy to be much higher than that, so we would have to accelerate the particles very, very fast for that. Maybe giant cyclotrons or particle accelerators colliding them at higher speed might work, but it would have to be a constant stream of the particles, and antimatter is hard enough to create in small amounts. A stream of antiparticles would be very difficult. Typical positrons are created by hitting accelerated electrons into a tungsten target and then using magnets to guide them into a trap. That uses a lot of energy already, and then moving those antiparticles into another particle accelerator after it's created will be doubly as hard. You'll need powerful magnets for all of that as well. Another way is if an electron is accelerated near the speed of light and hits a lower energy photon, such as from a laser beam, then the photon will gain that energy and become a gamma ray. We could get streams of electrons, accelerate them in cyclotrons, and then have them hit laser beams. I don't know how easy it would be to aim the electrons at the laser beam this way, but it is done currently in some experiments. It would require the electrons to be moving very, very fast to match the frequency of the gamma rays we want, which will take a lot of power. Plus, there is the difficulty of aiming it at the laser beam too. Finally, the last method is with a free electron laser. In this method, electrons are created by a laser beam hitting a target and then accelerated with a particle accelerator. These electrons are then passed between various arrangements of magnets, each causing the electrons to wiggle quickly. The electron wiggle causes photons to be produced based on the speed of the electrons, strength from the magnets, and distance between the magnets. Typically, they are in the range of microwaves to x-rays, but by making the magnets strong enough and the beam fast enough, we could get electrons to give off gamma rays. The question is, can we make it generate energetic enough gamma rays to get close to our optimal wavelength? I don't know. To make any of these methods useful, though, we'd need a constant beam of gamma rays in the right frequency. So we'd have to see how feasible any of these methods could be tuned. Of course, there's also some more exotic methods that might be used for shields like neutrinos, dark matter, dark energy, or zero-point energy, or other fanciful stuff like weird quark matter, gravitons, degenerate matter, muonic atoms, or something, but I have very little info on these, so I can't really talk about them much. Some of the heavier particles could be held together in a magnetic field and spun in a sphere, and the frame-dragging effect would move space around, flinging weapons fire away. If you can spin them fast enough, the extra kinetic energy they have might move space even further. It would take some very powerful machines like I listed earlier, and a very powerful power plant too. Ships would definitely need some fusion power plant to run them, or an antimatter power plant, or something else crazy. The other issues are if you can make the gamma rays bend space, how do you aim this gravitational field so it doesn't damage your own ship while protecting it? How do we make it into a shield shape around the ship? Does space bend around the gamma ray beam in a cylinder? Maybe getting two gamma ray beams to hit each other at just the right angle with constructive interference could warp space at a single point. If you aim two beams together, then do the waves radiate in a circular or spherical shape from the collision point? Do we aim the beams parallel to our hull, or perpendicular, or some other geometric pattern? We're going to need radiation protection for this system if we're going to be flinging gamma rays around all willy-nilly. Anyway, if the UEE has the technology to do all that, that would be the closest we can imagine for an in-game shield. But it requires some crazy hand wavium to do that. I would hope that in 900 years it would be possible. The same technology could work for quantum drives and artificial gravity too. Band space around you to fly faster than light, or cause objects to move in a direction you call down. I'm no physicist, so I'm happy to admit if my speculation is missing something. Let me know what you all think. 
Alright, so that's it for our Star Citizen Shield review. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. You can use my referral code if you decide to jump into Star Citizen and you'll get 5,000 extra in-game credits. Here's a big thank you to all my current Patrons. Please check out my Patreon membership to help me make more videos. All Patrons and members will have their names listed at the end of my videos and get access to my Discord channel. So feel free to sign up and let me know what you'd like to see next. Okay, catch you all next time.